Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as my guest Dr. Jim Mazzara. Dr. Mazzara did his medical school training at New York Medical College. He then went on to complete an orthopedic residency at St. Luke Roosevelt Hospital, which is a teaching hospital affiliate of Columbia University. Good morning, Dr. Mazzara. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. What, what I thought we would discuss today is, is a relatively new procedure that has been designed to treat a very a difficult shoulder problem in the past, or a group of shoulder problems. Uh, this is called reverse total shoulder replacement. So we're actually Correct. reversing the normal uh, total shoulder replacement. Tell me what type of patient was this procedure designed for and, and who could expect some benefit from this procedure? Uh, this is actually a uh, procedure that's available to patients who have either advanced rotator cuff disease where they have a large unfixable tear of the rotator cuff uh, under those circumstances, many patients will get advanced arthritis of the joint. Uh, the joint is out of balance, arthritic, painful, and those patients are either have pain or inability to lift and move the arm. Under the circumstances, you can't do a standard type of shoulder replacement even though those patients will have arthritis because they don't have an intact functioning rotator cuff. A number of years ago, the, uh, the designers of the reverse shoulder replacement took this into consideration and have reversed the process. And instead of replacing the ball and socket uh, as we would in a rotator cuff, uh, in, with, in individuals who have an intact rotator cuff, we'll reverse the process. And on the socket side, which is called the glenoid, we'll put a ball or a glenosphere on the other side, which is the upper part of the humerus, where we typically have the ball of the normal shoulder joint, we'll replace that with a socket. And what that enables the, those patients to do is to stabilize the joint and then lift and move the arm with their other functioning muscle, which is called their deltoid muscle, which is this large outer muscle on the outside of the shoulder. So even in the absence of a functioning rotator cuff, those patients can lift and move the arm now many of those patients will get much of their motion, they'll get a lot of pain relief. They may not get all of their motion back, but at the same time for somebody who's unable to lift the arm to any significant degree without a great deal of pain, lifting it halfway with minimal to no pain is, is a great benefit to them and a great relief for them. Mm -hmm. Now define for me a little bit, uh, why was the normal shoulder replacement not an option for these folks? Uh, because they had this rotator cuff problem. I, I remember, um, you know, the, the recommendations and, in, in fact, one of the key elements of a, of a rotator cuff, or excuse me, a, a, a replacement of the shoulder mm -hmm. was that the rotator cuff had to be intact, but why? Because it, if the rotator cuff is not intact in its standard shoulder replacement, the, set, the center of the head of the humeral component is not properly centered in the middle of the socket. As a result, there's abnormal eccentric loading on what we call the glenoid component. And if you have this shoulder replacement sliding back and forth on, an, on the glenoid component of the total shoulder replacement, it will cause premature loosening. And so what will happen is the shoulder replacement will, will actually fail and those patients will also be unable to lift the arm because the purpose of having a standard shoulder replacement is to resurface the joint if the rotator cuff is working without an intact working rotator cuff, they have no ability to keep the shoulder joint stable. If the shoulder joint is not stable, they can't lift the arm. So resurfacing it wouldn't do them any good. Mm -hmm. So how does a patient know if they would be a, a candidate for this procedure? Um, what sort of, of, of questions should they ask their physician to try to de determine whether this would help them or not? Well, you, you start with a good history and a physical examination and a series of x-rays. In many cases, for patients who have advanced rotator cuff disease, you can see it on the x-ray, you don't need an MRI. Uh, so somebody who's got a, a cuff tear arthropathy, for example, will have an x-ray that shows the head of the humerus, the head of the ball of the normal shoulder is out of the socket, it's risen up and it's immediately immediately under the bone called the acromion. So you can tell immediately from a plain x-ray that somebody's got a cuff tear arthropathy or advanced rotator cuff disease. Then you discuss those options with the patient and many of those patients will have pain impairment, functional limitations, 
and then you'll have to go through a further assessment of those patients. Eventually, you do need to get a CAT scan uh, to evaluate the quality and the amount of bone that's remaining. Mm -hmm. As in these patients who have rotated cuff disease and cuff tear arthropathy, and even patients who have normal shoulder arthritis, we'll need a CAT scan to take some measurements of how much bone has eroded away and what steps need to be taken to compensate for that eroded bone. Mm -hmm. Now, let's, let's look at this patient population because a lot of these folks that come to the point to where they have cuff tear arthropathy have had multiple surgeries. I mean, they've already had surgeries, True. attempts to try to repair the rotator cuff, maybe years before, maybe several. They're still candidates for this procedure. They are, yes. Uh, and, and those are people who have clearly tried and failed less dramatic options, less invasive procedure where you try to preserve and repair their tendon. The tendon is either unfixable or re-tears. They get to the point in time where they then have no rotator cuff tendon to work with. Mm -hmm. They get that pseudo-paralytic shoulder. They, they have pain. They have a shoulder that is out of balance that will not lift and move. They have profound weakness. And then those patients can actually do very well with the reverse shoulder. Now, what about a patient who's had an attempt at a regular type of shoulder replacement? Yeah. The old type, or, the, or I guess they're still used, but the type that you said may come to failure. Can that be converted to one of these newer um, prostheses? Uh, in, in fact, it can. Uh, the, the way you would do that is you would have to, again, evaluate the amount of bone, but you don't need a rotator cuff to replace the shoulder. All you need is the bone on the glenoid side or on the, the socket side of the joint and you can take out the old prosthesis. So if you've had a standard shoulder replacement that has either loosened or failed and your rotator cuff is torn over a period of time, you can still have the shoulder replaced or reverse shoulder replacement if your deltoid muscle is functioning. So patients need an intact functional deltoid muscle and normal nerves to some part of the shoulder to work that new type of shoulder replacement. So if they have some kind of nerve injury to the shoulder, or something has happened to the deltoid muscle and they don't have the deltoid to function and to stabilize and to elevate the arm, those patients are not candidates for a reverse shoulder replacement. Okay. Now, can you give us some idea of how this, this prosthesis differs? I know you've got some models to, to, that you would like to show and try to help us understand right. how this is different. So if you would. Okay. In, a, uh, in a standard shoulder or standard shoulder replacement, uh, this if, if the, this is the scapula, this side is the glenoid, this is actually part of the prosthesis here uh, for the reverse shoulder replacement. If we're doing a standard shoulder replacement, however, this metal, this metal piece would not be here. And we would take the arthritic shoulder, resurface that, and cement or glue uh, a plastic new surface on the end of the glenoid here. A standard shoulder replacement then uses this, the, this kind of a prosthesis where we have a ball or a sphere and a stem that goes inside the bone and you might be able to see internally in the bone that the stem is here attached to this new smooth surface and then with an intact functional rotator cuff if this side were plastic we'd be able to have the patient lift and move the arm like so. On the other hand in the absence of a rotator cuff you don't have the rotator cuff to stabilize the shoulder and so the standard kind of shoulder replacement as we see here wouldn't be appropriate. Under those circumstances, we'd have to reverse the shoulder replacement. And what we've been able to do is reverse it this way. And so we're putting the sphere on the side where the socket normally exists. And then we're taking the socket and we're putting it on the side where the sphere usually exists. And we're taking the shoulder and we're putting the cup on the ball. And patients who have an intact functioning muscle, which goes from here to here, can actually lift and move the arm like so. And so under those circumstances, people who don't have a rotator cuff can lift and move the arm and get excellent pain relief from this kind of reverse shoulder replacement. On the other hand, if we were to do a shoulder replacement on somebody who had a deficient rotator cuff, and if this were the socket and this were resurfaced with plastic, what would happen is the the ball would be pulled out of the socket and would be pulled up to the top of the shoulder and that patient would not be able to lift or move the arm and that causes failure of the standard shoulder replacement if you don't have an intact rotator cuff. That's why this reverse shoulder was designed and developed because patients will actually uh, 
come in with all kinds of conditions in the shoulder. People have an intact functional cuff, do exceptionally well with a standard shoulder replacement. Those who don't can still have an excellent result from a reverse shoulder replacement. You know, it's, it's interesting because um, for so many years, the whole design of implants, especially artificial implants, has been going towards reproducing the normal human anatomy as closely as possible. You know, we've tried to do that in, in the, the knee. We've tried to do that in the hip to mm -hmm. some degree. Um, we've tried to do that in the ankle. Now, all of a sudden, we're going uh, completely the opposite. So we're looking at, at a normal joint and saying, how can we make this work better given the constraints we are? Well, we have to take into consideration that there are other components that help to move and, and help that shoulder to function. And you can't replace a rotator cuff that's torn and unfixable. So what this new prosthesis allows us to do is to take that deficiency into consideration and adjust. And what we're able to do is now help patients lift and move the arm by by function of their deltoid muscle even if they don't have a rotator cuff to stabilize the joint. And you can't make tendons where you can't make tendons work where they don't exist. And so in many of those cases, patients who previously had no choice and had to live with their impairment and just had to deal with it are now given another option of having this reverse shoulder placement. And and the recovery is actually uh, fairly standard in terms of post op course. Uh, it really is going to depend on the procedure, the quality of the bone, and their preoperative function. So many of those patients within a matter of days to just a few weeks after surgery are going to be lifting and moving their arm and doing physical therapy and certainly should be out of their sling by six weeks and doing most of their activities by six weeks. It takes a long time for those people to get their motion back, however. You have to take into consideration that many of these shoulders have not been moving normally, sometimes for years. And now we're asking the deltoid muscle to do work it's not done in five, ten plus years. So it takes a long time for those people to get some of their function back. But they do see the pain relief fairly quickly. They do see some functional return fairly quickly. And many patients will actually recover their range of motion very early on in the process while others take a little bit longer. There tends to be another category of patients who can also benefit from reverse shoulder replacement, and that's the older patient who may be over 70 years of age who has a very severe fracture of the shoulder. Uh, one of the alternatives to the reverse shoulder is either repairing the fracture, if you can, but in many cases the fracture is so severe and in so many pieces it cannot be fixed. We're offering those patients a partial replacement of the shoulder and what we do is we take the broken pieces of the shoulder apart, take the head of the humerus off, and reassemble those broken pieces with their intact rotator cuff and attach them to an artificial stem in the shoulder. Many of those patients over 70 seem to benefit and get better function, earlier return of motion if you can do a reverse arthroplasty on those patients. And it's not for younger patients, but there are a lot of early studies, recent data that suggest that patients over 70 seem to do very well with that. Um, you mentioned for the reverse shoulder in patients who are contemplating that there's a little bit more in terms of uh, uh, preparation such as getting a CAT scan really trying to yeah. determine whether they'll benefit from this so it's it's a little different than the standard artificial shoulder joint is there anything else unique about these patients in terms of preparation for surgery that you typically want to see before you consider them a candidate well, whether they have a standard shoulder or a reverse shoulder, all my patients get a CAT scan. I need to look at the quality of the bone, how much of the glenoid uh, or the socket portion of the bone has been eroded. And that is important because when I place the prosthesis, it needs to be fairly precise and oriented in such a way where the end result is going to be a stable base plate, whether it's a base plate of a reverse shoulder or a standard total shoulder replacement. It doesn't really make much of a difference. If I can't be absolutely certain that their deltoid muscle is intact and functional, we'll get a nerve conduction test. But for the most part, you should be able to tell that on your physical examination. So many of those patients don't necessarily need any nerve conduction testing. But if there's ever a question, an EMG nerve conduction study is valuable. You know, so I want to make sure that uh, they, they don't have any other medical problems. So they'll go through a full, thorough medical evaluation by their primary care physician. They'll have to have a number of tests and studies done. But if they're stable enough and healthy enough to have surgery, 
the deltoid muscle is intact and they, we have a CAT scan, we can certainly go ahead and do the reverse shoulder for them, and those people seem to do quite nicely. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the hospital course. I'm assuming that this is not an outpatient procedure, that no, these patients not. are in the hospital. Yes, most patients will stay uh, at least a day. Some will stay two or three days. Many of those patients will be permitted to take off their sling a couple days after surgery and use their arm for what we call activities of daily living, which means they can kind of lift and use their arm in front of them. Uh, again, the, the deltoid is intact and working. Mm -hmm. There's no rotator cuff to worry about healing. So a lot of those people can start therapy immediately. And even on our standard shoulder replacements, patients are within a week or two out of their sling for many of their daily activities and using the arm fairly functionally early on in the process while they're doing physical therapy. Um, in some individuals uh, who have a completely deficient back part of the rotator cuff, they may be candidates for a reverse shoulder and a tendon transfer. Most of the patients that I see don't really require that tendon transfer. They seem to do very well without it. Now, long term, what should, what is your experience been in terms of, of how durable these types of procedures are with the reverse uh, artificial shoulder? Um, is this something that a patient should expect to last 10 years, 15 years, 5 years? What, what's your experience? Well, in terms of shoulder replacements, it, it can actually last many years. It's not a weight-bearing joint. Uh, it's not like a hip or a knee where you're stressing it on a daily basis. Uh, if uh, the patient doesn't have any other problems like fractures or infections uh, and there's no other issues with the nerves to the shoulder, those prostheses can last many years, 10 plus, 10 plus years. Uh, some, we don't have a lot of long-term data on the reverse shoulder replacement, although the data would suggest 10, 15 years is not unrealistic and even longer. Uh, for a standard shoulder replacement, if there's no loosening or problems with the glenoid or the socket portion of the replacement, those can last 15 plus years. Again, it's going to depend on what you're doing with it. And if you're out there banging up your shoulder continuously, you may cause it to wear out a little bit earlier. You, you can certainly loosen the glenoid. You can have a fracture. You can have other problems. So it's going to depend on what you do with it, uh, just like any other kind of shoulder replacement, any other joint replacement. We probably should define uh, the, the term banging up your shoulder for patients and, and define for them how durable this shoulder is. Is this the sort of thing that uh, their expectations should be that they can use this for strength activities? What types of activities do you allow them to do? Well, I, I, th I think strengthening activities up to a point are not unreasonable, but I don't, the weight training is, is not part of the recovery or expected course after any kind of shoulder replacement. So somebody who wants to be able to go back with a reverse shoulder and do normal de activities of daily living, not unreasonable to do that. I don't think the going back and playing tennis or golf, however, that would be an uh, unrealistic post-op course. Somebody, whoever, however, who may have a standard shoulder replacement could very well go back to play golf uh, and sometimes tennis. Depends on the level of sport they play. Uh, many of those patients can do some overhead activity in a standard shoulder replacement. There's no reason why you can't do overhead work uh, up to a point. Uh, certainly if it's, if it's not heavy duty, physically demanding work, it's not unreasonable. That's not likely going to happen if you have a, a reverse shoulder replacement simply because you're not going to have the endurance of a standard shoulder because you don't have an intact rotator cuff. You'll be able to lift the arm overhead if everything goes well and you can get to that point, but you're not going to have that endurance because your deltoid's not going to allow you to do that. Mm. So the joint's fine. It's joint's not going fine. to damage the joint. It's, it's, it's just muscles. you don't have the muscles to do That's it. That's exactly right. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about things surgeons sometimes don't like to talk about, and that is the potential complications yes. for a procedure such as this. What are you worrying about as the orthopedic surgeon placing this artificial joint during the surgery, in the time after the surgery, and then long term? What are the complications? Uh, I think during surgery, you'll always have to be concerned about uh, things like nerve damage, bleeding, and infection. Uh, you can never eliminate those risks of any surgical procedure. They're always part of any operation, no matter where it's done or who does it. Uh, you also worry about fracture. Many, remember, many of these patients will have a weaker bone, softer bone, and may be prone to fracture. Uh, Postoperatively, you're also worried about infection and medical problems or anesthetic issues postoperatively. Uh, if during the post-op course somebody somehow gets their arm in an unusual position, generally a position where it's way back in external rotation, you can actually potentially dislocate the shoulder prosthesis requiring a re-reduction of the prosthesis. Uh, that can more often than not be done 
in the operating room. It's not a big operation to do that. Fortunately, I've not had to do that yet, but at the same time, you do enough of these for long enough, somebody's going to dislocate their shoulder. Long-term, people have to worry about loosening. Loosening of the glenoid or the socket is one of those things that's always a concern, probably more of a concern in a, a standard cemented total shoulder replacement, less of a concern in a the new version of the reverse shoulder arthroplasty simply because some of the new designs that are coming out are allowing the bone to go, grow into the base plate of the prosthesis and a lot of that bone growth into the prosthesis will stabilize the joint and that's a wonderful thing to be able to have your body incorporate into the prosthesis. And then you also theoretically worry about the wearing out of the plastic or loosening of the plastic. Very, very uncommon. Uh, probably more common in standard shoulders that have been in for 15 plus years not really seen in the reverse shoulder replacements. Uh, and then you'd also have to worry about post-op infection. So somebody who postoperatively may have an infection somewhere else in their body can see the prosthesis. And so somebody who may have some kind of sepsis or infection, even patients who go to uh, for dental procedures can seed bacteria into the system, which we know can potentially cause an infection in the total joint prosthesis. So. Um, my own recommendation postoperatively is, is that patients will treat the, those conditions with prophylactic antibiotics. So if you're going to have your teeth cleaned, you need to be taking an antibiotic prior to that tooth cleaning, that teeth cleaning, simply re to reduce the chances of that getting infected. Now the chances of that happening are probably the most significant in the first couple of years. And there's some data that some of the authorities are saying, well, you may not need to do that. My own practice, however, I'm an advocate of uh, treating the worst case situation, so my patients are always recommended to take oral antibiotics before a dental procedure. And I guess one of, the, one of the recommendations too is in a patient who's had that artificial shoulder or any artificial joint, if that thing begins to get painful and maybe swollen and hot, they should seriously oh, absolutely. think about seeking some care. A any kind of abnormality other than what you perceive as what your physician says normal function for this kind of a shoulder replacement should prompt you to come back to the office. Uh, the other thing that, I, that I've seen, and again it's in patients who have softer bone, patients can have stress fractures. Uh, patients can, because they're putting a lot of st stress on the deltoid and that deltoid is attached to the acromion, uh, patients who are doing a lot of physically demanding activity can sometimes stress and fatigue the muscles, but I've had a couple of patients who have uh, sustained a little bit of a stress fracture of the acromion, and that stress fracture will heal very well. You just leave it alone, it heals by itself. Patients can very often get back to the level of activity and pain relief they had before that occurred. Mm. What's your current recommendation in a patient who has an artificial shoulder, whether it's reverse or the normal, uh, and they're not having any problems with their, sh their shoulder joint? When do you have them follow up with you? Do you follow these patients into the future, a yearly basis, two years, three years? What's your norm? Uh, I usually like to see patients every year for a couple of years and then every other year after that. And any time there's a question or a problem or a complaint or something's happened and they're just not quite sure what it is, they need to come back and let me take a look at it. As we close talking about the reverse artificial shoulder, is there any recommendations you would have for patients who may be thinking about this procedure or may have a condition that we've discussed that uh, is amenable to this and they, they, this is the first time they're hearing about it? Give them some advice. Uh, I, I think that's always the decision you have to make with your physician. Uh, your physician should be able to provide you with some information and uh, it's this operation, this reverse shoulder, is not for every patient who has shoulder pain or even every patient who has shoulder arthritis. It has to be individualized and it's a discussion that you have with your treating orthopedic surgeon. Uh, in terms of information out there, we provide some of that in the office and there's certainly some available on the internet and you just have to be careful about making sure that you discuss with your physician what you think is the most pro what they think and you think together is the most appropriate uh, treatment for you and your condition. Mm -hmm. Now, is this a widely used procedure at this point, or is this is this a procedure that's only done experimentally, or it's only done in certain centers? Uh, no, it's it's not experimental. It's actually been around for several years in the United States, but for many years in Europe prior to that. And not all orthopedic surgeons do shoulder replacements, and even fewer orthopedic surgeons do reverse shoulder replacements.
uh, it is something that I do within my practice. I have quite a bit of experience with it. And I think under the right circumstances, it can be tremendously helpful for patients to do that. But it, it is done by people who have a lot of experience with it, but not by all orthopedic surgeons. Okay. Well, this is excellent information for Thank patients. I, I sure appreciate you coming by and discussing this. And uh, uh, we'll talk again. Thank you.